we're going to have a good time in our Bible study here in a few moments. So glad you're here and part of what we're doing. As we've been prone to do, I've got a couple clipboards here, so if uh, you would please just let us know you were here by signing in, that would be much appreciated. And just kind of keep it circulating around to the You're back. Echoing. All right. I okay, Steve? Not too hot? Well, I'm glad you just did a little bit because I know you could do it where it's completely off. That'd be uh, appreciated by many. Um, just a couple things. I heard that uh, we had some decisions in Vacation Bible School. I ha can somebody share with me what the results were so far as far as salvations? Two saved so far. Praise the Lord. That's great. Yeah, we're excited about that. And uh, as you have been doing, continue to pray for the next two days of Vacation Bible School, tomorrow and Friday. And uh, we're just going to give all the glory to the Lord for whatever happens, but we're excited, and the kids are excited. Everybody that's coming seems to be enjoying it very, very much. Thank you, many of you who are part of our team that's ministering this week, and we thank you so much for your service. Um, Sunday evening, uh, of course, we'll have our regular Sunday services, of course, but on Sunday evening in our family service at 6, we're going to be having a time for Vacation Bible School. All the kids will be uh, on display and have a chance to sing and do some of the things that uh, they're doing at Vacation Bible School. But it's also a chance for us to invite the parents to come and be part of it. And so please uh, plan on coming and just if all of us would be extremely uh, focused to go around and and shake hands and welcome those parents who may be visiting our church for the first time, but they're coming because their kids came to Vacation Bible School. So please be faithful to uh, do that. Be a committee of one to just be sure to uh, make everybody feel at home and, and very warmly welcomed, all right? That's going to be a big deal. Um, we could use maybe if you still would like to bring uh, a few more packaged cookies. We could use those. We're going to have a uh, brief fellowship after the evening service, and we'll be uh, serving cookies and uh, having some light refreshment. So if you'd like to do that, that would be uh, outstanding. Even between now and Sunday, that would be much appreciated. Um, we're going to go to prayer here in just a moment, but if our ushers could please prepare, we'll receive our evening offering. Uh, I do want to bring to your attention a couple of things. Um, I understand that uh, Betty Shivers went to the hospital today and was at the emergency room. I do not know the, the uh, status of her health circumstance, but please pray for her. That's Beverly Shivers. And then uh, we got word this afternoon that Junior Zimmerman has gone home from the Maples. He's going to be at home, but they are bringing in hospice care to help take care of his needs. We're optimistic that's going to be a good change for Junior. Uh, if he can just get home and in his more natural environment, uh, get a little bit of strength back, I know the desire of his heart is to be here at church. And so we'd love to see him get back and return and do the things he loves to do, all right? So please be in prayer about uh, those situations along with some of the other prayer requests that are also mentioned here uh, in our prayer sheet tonight, all right? Brother John, would you mind praying for us today uh, for our offering, please? Amen. Lord bless you as you give this evening, and uh, so good to see you here tonight. Our Bible study is going to be in Daniel chapter 8, uh, after a very stimulating conversation last week. 
Uh, we're going to jump back into our uh, verse by verse study and examination of Daniel chapter 8. I believe we've got some exciting and, and, and interesting things to talk about tonight. Um, I once heard the story about a guy who was uh, pulling out of a parking spot and rather absent-mindedly he hit the car in front of him. Well, his first initial response was to uh, just drive away. But then he looked around and saw a whole bunch of people had seen and observed the accident and they were all just kind of taking inventory of what was happening. Well, he calmly got out of his car, proceeded to walk over to the car in front of him, and he proceeded to write a note. And he said, I'm sorry, but I accidentally hit your car in front of several dozen witnesses. They think I'm leaving my name, insurance number, and phone number. They're wrong. And then he put the sheet under the windshield, went back to his car, and drove away. Not a single person took down his license plate number because they thought he was doing the right thing. And he wasn't. Things aren't always what they appear to be, right? Well, our study tonight has that kind of a emphasis because uh, there are some really, really interesting things for us to dig in and find out. But... Uh, uh, I'll explain to you that there's some things that aren't always what they appear to be in this chapter, and we're going to see uh, some of those exciting and wonderful things. The other thing that I want to mention to you is that uh, based upon our discussion last week and the fact that we introduced this character that will one day impact world history that the Bible refers to as the Antichrist, and we looked at quite a bit of uh, possible examples of that, uh, some of the character qualities of that world dictator. But uh, in the course of our studies over the next number of chapters, we're going to encounter this character multiple times. And when we do, I'll be sure to point out those verses that pertain to the future Antichrist. All right? On Sunday night, Pastor preached, and he spoke from the book of Malachi. And you'll remember one of the things that he emphasized is that Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament, and following the writings of Malachi, the last prophet of the Old Testament, does anybody remember how many years of silence before the Gospels were written? Yes, before John the Baptist comes on the scene in the Gospels, he's the first prophet in a period of over 400 years. In fact, we talked about that intertestamental period between the Old Testament, the end of the Old Testament, the beginning of the New, as the intertestamental period, or the 400 years of silence. And Pastor was clear to mention it, and I want to reiterate this. Even though... We don't have any biblical writings during that time. Please don't misunderstand. Even though God was silent as far as, as giving us inspiration for the scriptures, God was not inactive. God is acting all the way through human history, and the 400-year period of silence was not a time where God was inactive. In fact, as we're going to see today, he's very active during the time of the intertestamental period as he's orchestrating all of human history to accomplish the things that he wants to accomplish. The other thing that I want to remind you of as we enter Daniel chapter 8 is that God is giving us these prophecies and they are written hundreds of years before these events take place. And fulfilled biblical prophecy is one of the great examples of the supernatural nature of God's word. Daniel wrote these things hundreds of years before they were accomplished. There's no way Daniel could have possibly known what was going to happen in these historical situations. 
Some of what we're going to read about has already been fulfilled in history. And we have the vantage point 2,000 years uh, following Jesus. We have the opportunity to look back in history and see that these things were fulfilled just like Daniel said they would be. But Daniel did not know that. He wrote these things and was puzzled by what he was predicting. And we'll see even in this chapter his response to some of that terrible insight that he was given under Holy Spirit inspiration about what was going to happen. Chapter 8 is also a change in the book of Daniel. You may remember at the very beginning in the introductory comments that I mentioned that much of the book of Daniel through the first seven chapters was written in another ancient language besides Hebrew. Does anybody remember what it was? Yeah, Aramaic. Yes, Aramaic. And so it's in Daniel chapter 8 that we start seeing that the book from here on is completed in the Hebrew language. And so even though there's a relationship between Aramaic and the uh, Hebrew it, it is a distinctive in the book writing of the book of Daniel. That mu much of it is written in Aramaic in the beginning, and at the end, it's Hebrew. The reason why I want to point that out is because much of what we're going to be talking about from here on, chapter 7 was uh, mostly in Aramaic, but from chapter 8 to the conclusion, it's all about the nation of Israel. And so... Daniel is writing these prophecies, and he's writing them in the Hebrew language. All right, we have the benefit of all of that being translated into our English, and so let's delve in, all right? Keep in mind, even though we're talking about the 400 silent years of biblical history, as far as the Bible is concerned, God is very active. What we're going to see tonight, I think, is extremely exciting. All right, let's jump in. Daniel chapter 8, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. You'll remember in Daniel chapter 7, we studied that a couple weeks ago, that it was the first year of Belshazzar that he had that vision for Daniel chapter 7. Now we're in the third year of Belshazzar when he has this vision all right and he's gonna write it down keep in mind if we're still in the reign of Belshazzar we're still in the period of the Babylonian Empire the head of gold in Nebuchadnezzar's great image or the lion that was in Daniel chapter 7 his vision it was the the, the head of gold the lion that was the nation of Babylon. Verse 2, And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw it, that I was at Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in a vision, and I was by the river Ulai. All right. What's interesting about that is Daniel is in the period of the Babylonians, but he envisions himself in this dream that he is in the capital of the Persian Empire, Shushan. And the, the, the city was built along the Tigris River, but there was this canal, Ulai, and it was an irrigation canal. They had tapped into the water, main water source of the river, and they used it to irrigate the crops and things like that in Persia. Okay, so he is, he is seeing this vision, but he's not in Babylon. He is in the capital of what will become the great Persian empire, Shushan. Then I lifted up my eyes, verse 3, and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward so that, so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand. 
but he did according to his will and became great. All right. We're going to read a little bit later in the chapter the interpretation exactly of this dream, but I'm going to go ahead and explain it, and then we'll confirm it in the interpretation of the angel that tells him what this all means. But you'll remember that following Babylon, we have the next world empire, the thorax of silver in Nebuchadnezzar's idol, and it was the image uh, of the bear, uh, no, I'm sorry, the uh, animal in Daniel chapter 7, the second one, the lion, and then, uh, sorry, um, yeah, it was a bear, okay, so this is the next world conquering empire, and it is the empire of Medo-Persia. The Medes and the Persians. That's why this ram has two big horns. But one of the horns will ultimately be bigger and more dominant. And that is exactly what happened historically to the Medo-Persian Empire. At first the Medes were kind of the superior nation. But as the Persians took over, they become the dominant leader in this alliance ultimately taking over the Medes. Most of the time, we don't talk the, about the Medo-Persian Empire. We just talk about the Persian Empire because the Persians will ultimately become the greatest. So that's part of this image of this ram with two horns, but one horn was more predominant because it will be the one that takes over. All right, we continue reading. Verse 5. And as I was considering, behold, an he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between its eyes. All right, this is the introduction of a third empire. And as we will see in the chapter, and it is going to be interpreted for us, it's the Greek empire, the Grecian empire. Very interesting. One of the signs of the Greek empire is a goat. And at the beginning, according to Greek tradition, the first city that was founded in the area of Greece was done when an oracle said, release a goat. And wherever the goat goes and stop, and feeds that's where you need to build the city and they did that according to Greek tradition this, this he goat they followed he finally stopped and they, there, they built the first Greek city there the city of Agi Agi all right? and it's located on a body of water and most of you would understand from the name of the city, Adji, that it's on the body of water known as the Aegean Sea. So the, uh, according to Greek tradition, the first Greek city was built upon the, the city of Adji, which means the goat city. And the Aegean Sea is the goat sea. Okay, so that's the emergence of of Greece and here we are with the Bible telling us Daniel sees the vision of this he goat and it is a very interesting description because it illustrates the speed with which the Greeks encountered the Persians did you notice that as he came from the west if we were in Asia Minor or in Persia, looking westward, that's where Greece is. That he goat comes from the west. And it is so fast that it's not even, it's like it's not even touching the ground, which is one of the characteristics of the great army of Alexander the Great. All right? So as the Greeks make this foray, 
pushing towards the uh, empire of Persia, they are just doing so with an amazing speed and tenacity and power. Let's keep reading. There's this goat, and it had a notable horn between its eyes. That's the one great king of the Grecian Empire, Alexander the Great. I just mentioned him. Verse 6, And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran upon him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with choler against him. Now that is not a word we use very much in our English language, but choler just means uh, hatred. He was angry and he hated this enemy he was encountering. Some of you will remember from your world history perhaps that the Persians, as they expanded their empire, they came into contact with Greece. And the Persians, uh, they started making overtures to try to defeat the Greek city-states. And Darius the Great, the great Persian monarch Darius, he made an attack against Greece and was rebuffed. Ten years later, Xerxes made an attack against Greece, and he too was stopped. Now, all of that predated Alexander. But Alexander, as he became trained, was uh, furious that the Persians had had the audacity to attack Greece. And that is why he still harbors this hatred towards the Persians. By the way, quite interesting. Alexander's dad was Philip of Macedon. And Philip, around 350 A.D., took control of all of Macedonia and Greece. In fact, Alexander, as just a young boy, was learning these military techniques from his dad, who was a great tactician. And, and he told his father, Philip, Dad, if you don't stop, you won't leave anything for me to conquer. And Philip said, Son, you can conquer anything you want. To which Alexander responded, then I'm going to conquer the world. And that's exactly what he did. Conquered the then known world with the speed of this he goat that just hardly touched the ground. It's, it's the middle portion of Nebuchadnezzar's image, but it's also the leopard. Remember the winged leopard with four wings that we saw in Daniel chapter 7, indicating the speed that he was able to, to move with. And that is what Alexander did. And he ran at, this, at, at the ram with such ferocity that he just destroyed it, just crashed into it, broke off both the horns. That's what it says in the next verse. And, and he came, verse 7, I'll read it again. And he came, uh, he, uh, and I saw him come close unto the ram. He was moved with choler against him, smote the ram, and break his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore the he goat waxed very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. Just as in the case with the Medio Persians. They were destroyed. The horns were broken. Now this great monarch, the one king, the one horn on the he-goat, he dies. And as we talked about last time, Alexander died right around the age of 33. Died in Babylon, lamenting that there were no more worlds for him to conquer. He had taken an army from Greece of 35,000 soldiers. And yet with the speed of this he-goat and the power and his 
tenacity for skilled stratagems. Uh, Alexander was just able to defeat everybody that came against him, including the massive Persian army that was clearly outnumbering Greece. They would still just crushed it. By the way, just an aside, one of the teachers for Alexander the Great while he was growing up, Aristotle. Aristotle was a personal teacher of Alexander the Great. And yet here at the age of 33, he dies. He had been wounded in a battle with one of his own soldiers. He was, uh, as he was trying to recuperate from that stabbing from one of his lieutenants, he caught a fever, and within two weeks he died at the age of 33. So Alexander, the great horn, is broken off. And then you'll con we continue to read uh, in the middle of verse 8. And for it came up four notable ones, horns, toward the four winds of heaven. I talked about this in Daniel 7. The four generals that will secede Alexander the Great. Lysimachus, who will take over Greece and Macedonia. Cassander, who will take charge of Asia Minor and, and eastward and northward. Then there was Seleucus the first who will end up with Syria and then eastward over toward Babylon and the old Persian em Empire, and then Ptolemy I, who's the general who will set up in Egypt, and ultimately, initially, he will control Palestine. But, but the Seleucids will take over that area. All right, so these are the four monarchs that will secede Alexander, but none of them ever will come close to the strength that Alexander had. And... Yet, let's keep reading. So the four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. Verse 9. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. He's talking about Israel. All right. Verse 10. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host and of the stars of the ground and stamped upon them. This is just to be understood that as he attacks the beautiful land, he is going to destroy many Jews. All right? That's the host of, the, of heaven and the stars. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away. And the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. All right. We're going to be talking about this son, uh, this, this reason of transgression. Because it's going to be referred to in the next verse as the transgression of desolation. Maybe you've heard it this way, even from the lips of Jesus, the abomination of desolation. All right? Let me just keep reading. So he's magnifying himself. He's setting himself up over the people of Israel. Um, and he cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. And I heard one saint speaking to another saint. All right, at this point... We're going to get some interpretation from an angelic being that's going to tell Daniel what all this means. Again, Daniel's seeing things in the future that he doesn't understand. He doesn't know what's going on with all this, you know, he goat and ram and trounce and everybody. But this is what I want to point out to you. Well, let's read the interpretation, then we'll jump into it. All right. Verse 13. I heard one of the saint, one saint speaking to another saint, said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. 
All right, now I understand you're, you're looking at that and you're going, what are we talking about? Let me give you a little bit of insight. This is something probably very few of you have ever studied in your history books or in school for sure. But uh, I, it's one of my favorite stories. This little horn that comes out of one of the four kingdoms is by all accounts the eighth king of the Seleucid dynasty. It's a man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus the fourth Epiphanes. I, I, I could get into so much more detail than I'm going to, but you just need to understand that Antiochus had been trained even though he was uh, in the line of the Seleucids, he had been trained in Rome. Because for a 12-year period, his daddy, Antiochus III, Antiochus the Great of the Seleucid Empire, had lost to the Romans. And they made him pay a huge tribute, a, a huge indemnity. And for 12 years, the Seleucids were going to have to pay the Romans because they were the victors. Well, the Romans took 20 hostages to Rome. And they, they said, if you don't pay, we will kill these aristocratic young men that are here in Rome. One of them was Antiochus Epiphany. They also trained them in the Roman ways. And so Antiochus was completely aware was, of what was on the horizon and that was this great and emerging Roman Empire that defeated his dad and then held him hostage for 14 years. Well, when he gets out of Rome, he returns back to Syria, the capital area of the Seleucids. And when he gets there, his brother, Seleucus V Philopater, write these down, write these down. <laughs> Be on the quiz. Um, he had died, and so Antiochus got there just in time to claim the throne for himself. But he was totally committed to the Hellenization or the Greek culture and language of the, of the Greeks, and he was set on making his entire empire capitulate to the Greek way of living. So when he becomes this little horn that becomes exceeding great, Antiochus Epiphanes decides he's going to destroy the Jewish people. Again, way too many details, except I'll say it this way. Antiochus was a great military man. He subdued the Jews right away. He said, we are going to wholeheartedly pursue the Greek culture. He established that there was going to be at the temple of God in Jerusalem a new worship for Olympian Zeus, one of the Greek gods. And he, at that point, that's when he called himself and desired to be called Antiochus Epiphanes. Because the word Epiphanes meant the manifest God. God manifest. Theos Epiphanes. God is in your presence. And that's what he claimed. That he was a deity and that the Jews needed to capitulate and worship him. He completely cut off all of the Jewish religion. He said they could not worship on the Sabbath. They could not circumcise their children. They could not uh, read the Torah. In fact, at that time, Antiochus gathered up a whole bunch of the Torah scrolls the scrolls of the Old Testament, and burned them, destroyed them. And it was all in an effort to make them become non-Jews. He wanted to stamp out the Jews. Well, after he had them subdued, left a command by the name of Philip there in Jerusalem, he took this mighty army of his down to Egypt. And he was conquering Egypt. But he got to Alexandria in 170 B.C., and at Alexandria, he met a Roman representative. 
And this guy said, I represent the Senate of Rome, and you need to evacuate Egypt. Get out. And the story goes that uh, Antiochus said, well, how much time do I have to decide? And, and this general from the Romans walked around him and drew a circle around him and said, before you leave that circle, you got to tell me what you're going to do. And if you don't leave with your army, Rome's coming after you. So he said, okay, we're leaving. And, and they left, but he was mad. And so when he gets back to Jerusalem, he decides to take it out on the Jews. 80,000 Jews were killed by Antiochus Epiphanes at that time, 169 B.C. And 40,000 were taken as slaves and sold into slavery within the Seleucid Empire. It was a massive effort to completely destroy the Jewish faith. A little bit later, he comes back on another military foray, and this is what happened. Maybe you've heard this part of it. But in, on Chislev 25th, write this down, write this down. No, I, it's, it's, it's our calendar, it's December 16th. All right? But on that day in 167 BC, Antiochus went into the temple of God at Jerusalem. He built an altar over the altar of God in Jerusalem. And he proceeded to offer a swine on the altar of God. Well, the altar of Zeus that was over. But he took the blood of this pig and just threw it all over the temple. And it was known by the Jews of that day as the abomination of desolation. And that's what Daniel's prophesying is going to happen over 200 years before it ever happens. But so this guy, Antiochus Epiphanes, dedicates the temple now to Zeus Epiphanes. And he's going to set up an image and require the Jews to worship it. And if they don't, or if they're discovered to have a, a, a Torah scroll, it was the death sentence. From that, he proceeds to initiate this radical religious reform forbidding the Jews to exercise their Jewishness. In fact, he was su such an egomaniac that he said, I'll tell you what, on the 25th day of every month, every village in Palestine needs to offer a pig as a sacrifice to me. And so every village was supposed to offer, every month on the 25th day of the month, they were to offer a sacrifice to Antiochus Epiphanes. By the way, I told you what Epiphanes meant, the manifest God. The Jews didn't refer to him as Antiochus Epiphanes. They just changed one little letter in the Greek and called him Antiochus Epimenes, which meant the madman. That's what they called him. So here's the story. In one little village, the town of Modin, which is about 17 miles north and a little bit west of Jerusalem, there was an older priest by the name of Mattathias. And when this legate representative from the king came to Modin, he required Mattathias to offer the pig sacrifice to Antiochus. Well, Antiochus, uh, uh, Mattathias said, I will not do it. I refuse. I don't care what you do to me. I will not offer that. Well, another Jew stepped forward to do it. And at that moment, his anti uh, I'm sorry, Mattathias' zeal was so great that he just grabbed a knife and killed this Jewish man and then turned around and killed the king's representative. And at that moment, he cried out that all of those who are zealous for the law Come out with me. And it was the beginning of the Maccabean revolt. And Mattathias Maccabee, meaning the hammer, 
and his oldest son Judas Maccabee, they proceeded to lead a rebellion against Antiochus. The odds were totally against them. And yet, just to hasten to the end of the story, the, the entire thing was totally and supernaturally controlled by God. And because of Judah's great uh, military abilities, they were able to defeat the Seleucids, even though they were outnumbered by huge numbers. A at one point, Antiochus' forces actually entered into Jerusalem on the Sabbath, and they killed a thousand Jews just to kill them because they would not resist. So Mattathias and his sons, they agreed it is, it is wholesome, it is right for us to fight on the Sabbath in order to secure our nation. Otherwise, we're going to be completely destroyed. Some of us in modern history think of the Holocaust in World War II, and we think, oh, that was a terrible thing where Hitler tried to destroy the Jewish people. Hey, I'm telling you, folks, the Jewish people have been attempt, people have tried to destroy the Jews all throughout history. And God has supernaturally intended over his people. And that's what happened with Antiochus. And so this will come clear to you here in a few minutes when we read the interpretation by the angel. Be because this is all happening, and Daniel says it's going to happen. Ultimately, this is what took place. So in 167, on Chislev 25th, three years later to the day, Chislev 25th, 164 B.C. Judah, Maccabee, conquered the city of Jerusalem, took over Jerusalem, except for a little small area, the high place of Jerusalem, and, and ultimately they defeated the Syrian forces there. But this is what happened. Three years to the day from when it was polluted by Antiochus Epiphanes, the abomination of desolation, three years to the day, it was rededicated as a temple back to God. Maybe you've heard this part of the story. When they came to rededicate the temple, they had to reconsecrate all of the oil that would go into the lamps of the temple. What Judas discovered was a small cruise of oil that would last maybe one day. But it was supposed to be eight days before they could reconsecrate enough oil to relight the candles during the dedication service. Well, according to Jewish tradition, the one cruise of oil lasted for eight days, miraculously, and therefore, the uh, Jews to this day, in the middle of December, around the 16th, Chislev 25th, they have an eight-day celebration that is known as the Festival of Lights, the Feast of Dedication, spoken of about Jesus attending Jerusalem during the Feast of Dedication in Mark's Gospel, but we more commonly refer to it as Hanukkah. The Jews to this day still celebrate the victory of Judas Maccabee over Antiochus Epiphanes every year when they observe Hanukkah. That's what it's about. I heard this story where a man in a former uh, Iron Curtain country said to a Jewish man one time, our government's trying to destroy all the Jews. What are you going to do? And the man smiled and said, we'll probably have a feast day. <laughs> Pharaoh tried to destroy us. We celebrate Passover. Haman tried to destroy us. We celebrate the Feast of Purim. Antiochus Epiphanes tried to destroy us. And we celebrate Hanukkah. If people try to destroy us, we're probably going to have a feast day. Hey, God was superintending over this. Now, this is the part that I need to just explain that things aren't always what they appear to be. This part of the story is pretty straightforward. 
this little horn that comes out of the one of the kingdoms, the eighth king of the Seleucids, is this wicked, wicked, evil man, Antiochus Epiphanes. By the way, we read that 2,300 days would be to his end. When he entered in, in uh, 169 B.C., he initiated this atrocity against the Jewish people by limiting their religion. Do you know that almost exactly 2,300 days later, Antiochus Epiphanes died by a terrible, terrible disease? He was not destroyed by man. He was destroyed by God. 2,300 days after he desecrated Jerusalem and the temple. Uh, just that little tidbit. All right. What I want to point out, though, is that it's sometimes in biblical prophecy, and this is the case with Daniel, there is a dual prophecy entailed in the same prophetic look. There is what we would refer to as a prefillment of that prophecy and then an ultimate fulfillment. Okay? The prefillment of this particular abomination of desolation is Antiochus Epiphanes. The ultimate fulfillment of this prophecy is going to take place during the Great Tribulation when the Antichrist will do something very, very similar to the temple of God in Jerusalem during the Tribulation period. All right? So kind of keep that in mind as we read the rest of the chapter with very little comment. All right, verse 15. And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So we're talking about the archangel Gabriel. He's going to help Daniel understand. Well, we've already been talking through all this, so you'll see it as Gabriel tells him what's going on. Verse 17. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But as he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Now, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground, almost as if he's dead. But he, the angel, touched me and set me upright. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last uh, end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now that being broken, wherefore as four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. In other words, they're not going to be near as great as, as Alexander the Great was, the first king of Grecia. Now verse 23 to the end, there's going to be these comments, and some of them are going to pertain to Antiochus Epiphanes, but some of them are going to have a dual fulfillment ultimately with the Antichrist during the tribulation period we talked about last week. The point is this, as powerful as Alexander was and as absolutely terrifying as Antiochus Epiphany was for, for the Jewish people, the Antichrist is going to be a hundred times worse. So even though Antiochus did his evil deed against the people of Israel, God destroyed him. And ultimately, God is going to be the only one that can deal with the Antichrist during the tribulation period. Verse 23. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, doesn't that sound like our age? Sin 
coming to its complete fulfillment. Everything that's going on around us, evil continually, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the time coming of the Son of Man. A king of fierce countenance and understanding, dark sentences shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. Because as we observe, the Antichrist is going to be empowered by Satan. All right? But he's going to come on the scene. He's going to speak these magnificent words, dark sentences. It's going to be a cultish. Verse 24 again. And his power shall be mighty, but not his own power. He shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. Talking about the Jewish people, right? The Antichrist, when he comes on the scene, is going to ultimately make a war against the people of God. His goal is to stamp them out. At the temple of God in Jerusalem, at the midway point of the tribulation, after the first three and a half years, the Antichrist will come to the temple of God and he will turn it into a temple to worship him. Along with the, the, the false prophet, they will build a great image and people of the world will be required to worship, worship the image of the beast. It's an image dedicated to the Antichrist. All the while, he is efforting to stamp out the Jewish people. All right? Verse 25. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hands. In other words, witchcraft. He's going to have the ability to do signs and wonders. And people of the world are going to be drawn to him. And he shall magnify himself in his heart. And by peace shall destroy many. In other words, he's going to come on the scene. Peace and safety. He's going to make treaties with people, even the Jewish people. But ultimately, he's going to turn that on all of them and try to destroy them in a huge act of rebellion. And he shall also stand up against the prince of princes. Now, that's why we know we're talking about the Antichrist and not the prefilment of this prophecy with Antiochus. Antiochus was destroyed without human hands, but he never, he never came against Jesus. The prince of princes, the king of kings, the lord of lords, the god of gods, that's Jesus. And the Antichrist is going to come up against Jesus at the latter part of the tribulation. But he shall be broken without hand. Brothers and sisters, I, I don't want you to hear this prediction, hear these prophecies, and, and lose hope. We're going to read about Daniel's response to the visions. He gets physically sick when he hears what's going to happen to his people. I want to remind you that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says... When the son of perdition, the man of lawlessness is on the scene, that's the Antichrist. And when he's going to come, he's going to deceive many, and there's even going to be Christians that are going to be concerned and dismayed. But I want to remind you, as we talked about last week, we believe based upon the biblical understanding of things that God is going to rescue all of the believers who are on the planet at the time that the Antichrist is revealed to the world. The rapture. All of the Christians, the ones that are dead will be resurrected. Those who are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet him in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The truth of the matter is God is going to spare us from that terrible time of tribulation that's coming. But the Antichrist is going to have his way. And in the, uh, 
something that magnifies the power of what Alexander the Great did and certainly dwarfs what Antiochus Epiphanes does, Alexander, uh, the Antichrist is going to come on the scene and he is going to just be the worst dictator in the history of the world. In fact, Jesus said it this way. You might want to look at Matthew chapter 24 just for a second. I just want to give you context because Jesus references this event that we're talking about in Daniel 8. Matthew 24. Of course, this is, the, this is the Olivet Discourse. He's prophesying a lot of things that are going to take place at the end time. Notice Matthew 24, 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. In other words, Jesus is saying, hey, this is yet to come. The abomination of desolation that he's referencing from Daniel. The Jews had referred to what Antiochus Epiphanes did as the abomination of desolation. But that was just kind of a prefilment of what will be the ultimate fulfillment with the Antichrist. All right, and this is the key verse, verse 21. And then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. We would talk about the, the Holocaust of World War II and the six plus million Jews that were destroyed by the Third Reich. And we would talk about that being, that, that is the worst atrocity in the history of the world for the Jewish people. Jesus said, there's coming a great tribulation such as has never been in the history of the world, no, nor ever will be. That is what's going to happen when the man of perdition, the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, is revealed during the tribulation period. Again, blessed hope for us, we're not going to be here if we're alive at that time when it happened. The people that are Christians around the world will be raptured. But the people who go through the tribulation, that seven years of terrible ordeal, they're the ones that will witness and see this. All right, back to Daniel with the final, final thoughts. So again, he'll stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without, a hand, without hand. I want to remind you, we're on the winning side. Because at the end of the tribulation, Jesus is physically going to come back, and at that time... Jesus, in his own power, really without firing a shot, is going to destroy the armies of the Antichrist at the Battle of Armageddon. And he will imprison the Antichrist and the false prophet and the beast and Satan and throw them into the lake of fire. That's our prince of princes who will prevail and destroy the Antichrist without a ha human hand involved. God's going to do it. Jesus is going to do it. And then Jesus will establish his thousand-year millennial reign. Okay? Verse 26, to wrap this up. And the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterward, I rose up. And did the king's business. And I was astonished at the vision. But none understood it. All right. Do you understand what we've just studied tonight? Hundreds of years before it ever happened, Daniel receives a vision. Talking about the Medes and the Persians rising. Talking about the Greeks rising. Talking about this little horn that becomes very great and exceeding fierce. Antiochus Epiphanes of the Seleucid dynasty. And all of that took place. And you know what? When Daniel, in his mind, saw what was going to happen to the Jewish people with Antiochus Epiphanes and then with ultimate fulfillment, 
that he couldn't understand or, or, or see all the way to the Antichrist. But when he saw what was going to happen to his people, it sickened him to realize how much devastation was going to take place among the Jewish people. And that is why he was sick on his bed for several days in the aftermath of this. Didn't fully understand it, only understood what, the, what Gabriel had told him the interpretation was. But there was so much he could not comprehend or understand. The story is told when Alexander the Great, who was sweeping through the world to conquer it, when he came towards Jerusalem with intentions of conquering Jerusalem, a Jewish priest met him. This is a similar story to what I told you about Daniel and Cyrus the Great of the Persians. But he, this Jewish priest, gave Alexander a copy of Daniel and said, you're in here. Read it. And it says, it, the story is said that when Alexander read what took place in our study tonight, Daniel chapter 8, and realized it was talking about him, and he knew that that old scroll had been written hundreds of years before and was explaining him coming, it says that he fell down on his knees and worshipped. Now, that's, that probably was not anything that resembled a saving faith, but he was in awe of the God of the Jews, and he spared the city of Jerusalem. Folks, I just want you to understand, God is in control of all of it. Just as he was in complete control in the fulfillment of these prophecies, we can rest assured he's going to be fulfilling everything else that is still coming. And we can take great consolation in that. And the one thing we should take great consolation is, is what we're going to study in the book of Titus coming up, and that is that we have a blessed hope. And that is the fact that our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, is in control, and he's coming again. All right? Therefore, be comforted by these words. Father, thank you for the time to be together. Thank you for the patience and kindness of these dear folks. I ask, Lord, that you would help us to be encouraged as we continue to study your word in Daniel. We ask these things in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. God bless you folks. Have a good evening.